Hello, my name is Augusta Monk. Welcome to the second clip on improvisational intelligence. In the first uh, video clip, I gave you a brief overview of what this um, theory of improvisational intelligence is about. In this second clip, I'm going to cover all the aspects that make up the approach to improvising from a cognitive perspective. This is a more practical uh, presentation. Uh, it's uh, targeted to practicing improvisers, to musicians, and I'm hoping it's useful in its uh, subsequent application. This video clip consists of three parts. In part one, I'm going to go through all the different uh, cognitive processes we use while improvise. I'm going to demonstrate some of those on the keyboard. Part two features three models in which some processes work together. And in part three, I'm going to show you uh, how we can move from one model to another model. As I mentioned in the first clip, when we improvise, we use three types of thinking behaviors. We use residual behaviors, emergent behaviors, and monitoring behaviors. We also said that it is the monitoring behaviors that mediate the uh, activity between residual behaviors and emergent behaviors. So first, I would like to cover residual behaviors. There are five types of residual behaviors. We have functional strategies, embedded strategies, long-term oral memory, working oral memory, and preconceptions. The first two are what I call operational processes. Functional strategies and embedded strategies are operational strategies, operational residual behaviors, because this manifests in actions. They make us do things while we improvise. The other three behaviors, long-term oral memory, working oral memory and preconceptions are what I call informative behaviors. These behaviors give us perspectives or ideas or make, make us reflect on what we're going to do. The first residual behavior that I would like to cover is functional strategy. It's an operational behavior. Functional strategies consist in all the things that I apply with a specific purpose while I'm improvising. Uh, that means that I need to identify a particular goal or a particular improvisational problem that I need to solve. So let's say that I'm improvising something around this motif, this idea. At this point, I'm identifying an improvisational problem, which is I want this motif to start taking off. I don't want to remain uh, within this three note, with this, this range. I want the motif to go somewhere from here. That's the problem that I consciously identify. So I quickly go through my reservoir or stra of strategies and, and I pick one device that I know uh, to, to take care of that problem. So, okay, I'm going to change the last note and replace it by a higher tone. So, for example, okay, functional strategies can deal with any type of improvisational problem. In this case, I was dealing with the problem of uh, giving direction to the improvisation, but it could be anything. Uh, it could be that I want to activate my accompaniment. It could be that I want to create more contrast. What is actually definitive of, um, of a functional strategy is that the problem is consciously identified. I can name it. I, I, when I, while I'm improvising, I'm aware of it. And similarly, the strategy that I apply is a strategy that I already know, that I probably have practiced, that I'm aware of, that uh, I have applied in other improvisations, and it's applied on purpose to take care of that problem. That is functional strategies. Another very common residual behavior or, or process within this uh, residual category is what I call embedded strategies. Embedded strategies are things that I do more unconsciously, that are so embedded in my musical, um, uh, in my music making, that I can apply as second nature. 
for example, let's say that I Im start an improvisation and I go like this. Okay, this, this is a short motif. The strategy of starting an improvisation with a short motif is embedded in my improvisational practice. I have done it many times. I think it's a good way to do it. I just can do it even without thinking. When I started improvisation, I did not even think about that. I didn't think uh, I'm going to, um, I want to start with a short motif. It wasn't that consciously articulated in my mind. Had it been consciously articulated, then we would have been dealing with a functional strategy. Functional strategies and embedded strategies are both operational processes within the residual behaviors. The other type of residual behaviors is the informative behaviors or informational behaviors. Uh, the first one I would like to talk about is long-term oral memory. Long-term oral memory is the oral or conceptual recollection of a sound or a musical concept. Uh, for example, let's say that I'm studying an improvisation and I say, okay, I would like to start with, um, with a minor Dorian sound. I already, um, before starting the improvisation, I can recollect this, uh, this sound. So in this case, long-term oral memory is only informing my embedded strategies, uh, for example, in the sense that uh, this descending line I just played didn't have a particular purpose. It was a sound and, and a type of improvising motif-oriented that is very embedded in my vocabulary. Another informative uh, type of um, uh, residual process is working oral memory. Working oral memory is basically the same as long-term oral memory, with the difference that working oral memory draws from what has happened in the improvisation uh, itself. Uh, so it's a more recent uh, type of recollection. Now, to give consistency to my improvisation, I'm going to go to the same motif that I just played before. That's a simple example of working oral memory, bringing back to the improvisation something that happened in that piece. In this case, it was very close to its original uh, first uh, appearance, but it doesn't have to be. The last uh, process I would like to cover is preconceptions. And preconceptions have to do with all the guidelines that I, I assign to myself or all the things that um, somehow dictate aspects of the improvisation. Uh, some of the preconceptions uh, occur before uh, I start improvising, others occur while improvising. I'm about to start an improvisation and I think, okay, uh, I want something uh, quite groovy. This is a preconception that is informing already my functional strategies. Here we have compositional thinking, unpredicted procedures, safe play, and accidents. All these four are operational behaviors. And we also have a number of informative behaviors. These are focus, reacting, searching, and adjusting the script. Quite a few. Compositional thinking is any, um, any choices that I make uh, having to do with the structure of the musical discourse. Uh, as we're going to see later, they are very similar to functional strategies in a way. The fact that they are um, identified uh, spontaneously makes this type of thinking uh, an emergent behavior. For example, let's say that I'm playing something like this.
okay, my compositional thinking is telling me keep going up, keep going up with these resolutions of the last, of the of this motif. So this is what I played. Now my compositional thinking tells me on C. Now one more time, and now my compositional thinking tells me land on a chord sustain. Uh, let me give you another example. Let's just start with this. I'm thinking, okay, here's a second. I like that sound, move that. That's my compositional thing at the moment. And my compositional thing is telling me, okay, now you gotta go down here. So another very interesting uh, emergent behavior, operational for sure, is what I call unpredicted procedures. Unpredicted procedures are those moments in which you find doing something that you've never done before or something that you quite can that you quite cannot anticipate how it's going to uh, come out. Let's say that I'm improvising and then I end up I, I then I say okay, let's drill both hands. This is something I've never done before. In this case, making phrases with different uh, intervals, trilling with both hands. Uh, sometimes an unpredicted procedure can be something that you have done before, but you quite can't anticipate the outcome. So, for example, let's say um, that I play with um, lots of uh, angular intervals, right? I have done that before, but uh, uh, if I do it faster with both hands, I quite can't tell what's going to come out, 100%. Uh, so it would be something like this. Uh, I'm playing more from, from a kinesthetic feeling than from an oral feeling. Another emergent behavior, uh, which is indeed operational, is what I call safe play. Safe play consists in, in playing something that is safe to your fingers and safe to your thinking. It's a comfortable place. All that is coming out is more of the same thing. In that sense, it's emergent. Okay? There's nothing wrong with playing with safe play or there's nothing wrong for that matter with any of the procedures I'm covering. It's all about how we use them and um, what place they take within the network, right? Again, I'm going to cover this in detail in the second part of this clip. Uh, another example of safe play This passage is safe because I'm um, I'm not challenging my thinking or I'm not questioning my thinking. I'm sort of taking a cognitive vacation. I could do the same thing, play the same thing from a different cognitive place, such as say functional strategies. In that case could be, okay, let's say that I have a very busy type of improvisation and I think, okay, now let's play something very open to create contrast. So now I'm thinking differently about it because I'm playing it for a specific purpose. I was playing the busy part, perhaps the angular one. Contrast. Right? It's a very different cognitive feeling uh, than, for instance, starting an improvisation thing. Well, okay, I'm not sure what I'm going to play and I don't want to you know, risk too much, so let's just start nice and easy. Another uh, merchant behavior is the accident. Accident it's, is an operational behavior and, and it's a tricky one because when we improvise, I claim there are two kinds of accidents. Uh, there is the accident in which I'm very busy and very, very conscious of what's going on and I play a wrong note and that's an accident. Now, that's an accident because it's, it's a wrong note because it's a miscalculation, perhaps a technical flaw. Uh, there was some sort of a short circuit in my cognitive uh, mechanism, but I was paying attention and I was very, very alert. Uh, the accident I'm referring here as an emergent behavior is the accident uh, uh, that 
occurs when we are uh, when we are not thinking very hard, and we sort of um, our our uh, attention sort of goes down a bit, and we sort of take things for granted. It's basically when we are distracted. Um, now the accident itself is not the material; it's not the wrong note. What is uh, accident as a cognitive process is assigning the erroneous value to a musical event is saying oh i didn't mean that or uh, gee that, that wasn't very good it, it's that kind of thinking so g flat augmented and uh, i go uh, say ah no 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 I, this is not what i meant this this uh, fourth here is not what I meant. This is outside the key. This is not what I meant. Uh, it's not the kind of sound I was looking for. But I just sort of allowed my fingers to go there, right? And and therefore I label. It's not what I was expecting, and therefore I label this as an accident. Within emergent behaviors, we find a number of uh, informative processes, four actually. The first one is focus. Focus is that moment in which I consciously decide to focus precisely on an idea or an approach or a, a concept or a material, whatever I decide to narrow down my improvisation to. Let's say I start with this. Okay, this is my, the beginning of my, my improvisation and I figured, okay, here's I'm, I'm playing a major seventh. So I'm going to construct a melody with major seventh, a harmonic major seventh. Making that decision of saying, okay, the improvisation is about this, that is focus. And this focus is now informing my compositional thinking. My focus is telling me, okay, just make a melody in compositional thinking with this interval. Another um, uh, emergent behavior, informative behavior, is reacting. Uh, reacting can also inform focus, is the moment in which you find things. Uh, you're not searching for anything in particular, but you bump into something. Let's say that I'm improvising here. Uh, okay, that was an accident that just happened, right? But my, my uh, reacting tells me, ah, that was actually a good thing. So my, now my reacting informs my compositional thinking and tells me, okay. I can use this in my accompaniment. And I'm gonna use it in my melody. So um, reacting was that moment in which I bump into something. In this case, it was an accident, <laughs> a wrong note, but it could have been something else that I identified as ah, okay, that's that's valuable. Another um, emergent behavior is searching. Uh, searching is the act of searching, but not searching for anything in particular. In other words, I'm alert. Uh, and I know I need material, is the state of being alert to see what comes up. I start my improvisation. Okay, that was searching already. Uh, searching is not selecting, uh, reacting maybe selecting or focusing maybe, maybe uh, choosing the material. Searching is listening, as I just did, let's see what comes up. Right? So it's just this uh, state of alertness that makes me aware uh, of what, what the improvisation is suggesting. So the last emergent behavior I want to cover is adjusting the script. Adjusting the script um, means to acknowledge uh, and pursuing a new direction in the improvisation that departs from uh, a pre-established plan or, or a direction that was somehow uh, clear up to the point of uh, making the left turn. So let's say that I'm using um, 
uh, a plan or, or a, a, the preconception, the guideline of playing on, on F here, or white keys here and black keys on the right hand. Now, unless I decide, or unless, um, unless something happened, the plan so far is carry on using this bitonal texture or, or sonority. Now, at a certain point, I may decide, okay, let's, let's change. In this case, could be, okay, let's, let's revert the hands. And this is... So that, that turn, that shift, was a point at which I adjusted the script. So the last uh, type of behaviors I need to cover are the monitoring behaviors. These are behaviors that have to do with assessment and evaluation. I call these evaluative behaviors. They are not operational, uh, neither um, informative as in emergent or residual. I classify the monitoring behaviors basically in, in three categories. Uh, first layer, which is where the monitoring is uh, the least active. A second area, a second layer, in which the monitoring is um, a little bit more alert. Um, and a third uh, layer, in which the monitoring is alert and more directed. I'll explain as I move along. The first monitoring behavior to talk about is what I call continuous assessment. And continuous ass assessment represents the first layer of monitoring. Continuous assessment uh, means that when I improvise, I'm not paying special attention to, to what I'm doing. I'm not focusing in any aspect of improvisation, but I am aware of what's happening and I'm somehow um, uh, gathering all the events that take place while I'm improvising. For example, let's say that I start my improvisation. Just by being present in what, what I was doing, which is continuous assessment, I remember that I play three phrases that the first one, that the first two had a, a melody in the right hand and the third phrase reproduced this melody in the left hand. I have uh, three other forms, uh, three other behaviors, uh, assessment points, anticipated hearing and snapshots, snapshots of elapsed time. These three behaviors can occur in the second or the third layer of monitoring. And I think that um, the, the, in order to determine whether I'm in the second or in the third layer, I need to look at the solution that my monitoring produces. Let's take, for instance, assessment points. Assessment points are those moments in the improvisation in which I um, bring attention to any aspect of what I'm doing. I question myself, or I ask myself, so let's say that I'm improvising over these changes. And my assessment point at this, uh, at this particular uh, uh, moment is asking me, uh, He's asking me, uh, how about landing on the major seventh of the chord? Uh, that's an assessment point in which I'm wondering, is this uh, a good place to land? Here's another example of an assessment point. Say I start over, uh, over those changes. My assessment point determines, shall I continue this informing my composition of thinking of emergent behaviors? And is this a good idea, idea to determine, to continue? And the answer is yes, of course it is a good idea.
very similar to assessment points is snapshots of elapsed time. Um, the snapshots are basically the same as the assessment points, but they ask specific questions about timing. In a way, they are a form of assessment points, and perhaps they would be considered a, a, a class within the category of assessment points. But uh, questions about timing or pacing are so important in improvisation that I prefer to treat them as a separate category um, onto, them, onto themselves. So now I'm asking myself, shall I continue with this idea uh, or shall I move on to something else? Have I spent enough time with this idea? Is it time for something new? Um, that type of questions regarding time or pacing um, uh, constitute the snapshots of the last time. The, Last um, form of monitoring we have, le the last behavior, is anticipated hearing. Now this is a little different because continuous assessment, assessment points, and snapshots of the last time evaluate past event, events, things that have already happened. Anticipated hearing is the form of monitoring that obviously um, um, evaluates what is about to happen. Um, anticipated hearing can happen uh, either, well, on any form of, 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 um, of any type of material. I can anticipate my next note, or uh, literally, uh, I can anticipate the, 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 the sound of a specific rhythm, or it can be more conceptual. I can anticipate a shape or a peak. It can be a, a little broader. Uh, here's an example of anticipated hearing. Let's take uh, the changes of There Will Never Be Another You. And, uh, okay, let's say that I start improvising. So what I'm anticipating here is this interval of the third landing on the major seventh of the chord. Uh, I was anticipating this, this major seventh sound. This anticipation was also informed by my, uh, by my work in oral memory because in the first um, uh, two bars before I had landed on the major seventh chord also. This time over a minor chord but uh, major seventh nonetheless. I mentioned before that monitoring happens at three, uh, over three different layers, a sort of taxonomy as it were. The first layer was the, the continuous assessment. I'm only storing what's happening. I said the other two layers um, work with the other processes, assessment points, snapshots of elapsed time or anticipated hearing. Now, whether I'm working on the second or the third level depends on the solution or the answer that my monitoring system produces. Let's say that I start with there will never. Okay, great. So now I'm going to start to anticipate. Okay, what's going to happen next? I'm trying to decide what's going to happen next. And the answer is not produced. I'm not too sure. So I was alert. I consciously ask myself a question. What, what would be the next motif? How, how, should I, how should I proceed? But the answer that I produced was either not very clear or it was not produced at all. In that case, I argue that we are working on the second layer. We are engaged, but we are not really producing very smart uh, uh, answers. If the answers are smart, if, if they are clear, if they are focused, if they are um, uh, intended decisions, very, they really inform my other processes, then we are working on the third layer of monitoring. The evaluation is really sharp and it's producing satisfactory answers. So in this case,
How do I continue? By going up half a step. That was a good answer.